Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to um, our partial class. We took a bit of a hiatus last week for Thanksgiving. It was my first Thanksgiving as a new American, so it was very exciting. Um, and I'm very happy to be back with you all tonight. We are at Parsha Bayetse. We are slowly making our way through Sefer Breshit, which is really exciting. Um, and there's so many amazing parts uh, to this Parsha that could be discussed. Um, Yaakov's dream, um, beginning to uh, join the family of Lavan, all the stories about uh, Rachel and Leah. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and what I think is really exciting about the topic that I've decided to choose for tonight is that we have the opportunity to explore a lot of these things um, without having to choose only one, because I'm interested in exploring how the general story of Yaakov and Rachel can map onto the story of Rabbi Kiva and Rachel from the Gemara. Some of you might be familiar with those stories already, um, and that's what I'm hoping we're going to do tonight. I'll say, as I uh, share the sheet in the, the first sheet in the chat, that I don't have full conclusions about what all of the comparisons are just yet. So obviously your participation um, is always welcome, but especially um, exciting for tonight because if you see connections that I don't, which I'm sure you will, I'd love for you to share them. Um, okay, yes. Uh, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Great. Okay, so, um, there's a lot of different uh, parallels that I found between stories of Rabbi Kiva and Rachel. Before we get to every single one, I'll just share a quick rundown um, in case some people are not familiar and why I see it as a useful part of the project um, of what we're doing here. Um, I The goal is to see Gemara sources um, that help us understand the Parsha a bit better. Um, and so I think that these stories that we have about Rabbi Kiva and Rachel, um, maybe learning them um, and their collection here, usually we have like one study that we focus on. Instead, we're going to be seeing stories about Yaakov, um, Rabbi Kiva and Rachel that are recorded throughout the Gemara. Um, hopefully by reading these, we might be able to see some similarities and contrast um, to the story that we might know from the Parsha. And then um, hopefully we can see that there's like some new things to be gained from doing it that way. I'll share the link uh, in the chat um, so that everyone gets it again. Um, and then we'll begin. Okay, so um, the first source that we have is about Yaakov and Rabbi Akiva both being men of learning. Um, and so that's what I want to show first. Uh, the first source that we have here um, from, this is actually from last week's verse of the Parshat Tolda when we're first introduced to Yaakov when we see him being born with Asaph as twins that are causing trouble um, for Rivka. And we see how they're different. We see a contrast between Asaf and Yaakov. Um, we see that uh, Asaf is a skillful, a skillful hunter, a man of the outdoors. But Yaakov is a mild man raising livestock. Um, specifically, the, it's an interesting translation choice because when you look at the Hebrew, Yoshev, Isham Yoshev Halim, that he was sitting uh, in the tent. So it's interesting that he gets put as a livestock person there. But it's clarified by Rashi that Yoshev Ohalim is not just your typical tent, but it was the Ohalo Shel Shem, the Ohalo Shel Eber. Shem and Eber are biblical characters that were understood to have a yeshiva, that they were learning. I guess we could ask a lot of fun questions regarding how did they have a yeshiva if uh, Torah was not given yet on Har Sinai. Um, that sounds like a fun anachronism that often happens um, in rabbinic texts. But the idea here is that they want to portray Yaakov as someone who was learning from a young age, and that was his personality trait. And then, of course, Rabbi Akiva was a man of, of learning, he was a rabbi. So now we have a source from Avot Rabbi Nathan, which is not technically the Gemara, um, but it is another um, ton of edic source that actually is um, kind of goes along as a pair with the Avot from Ethics of the Fathers. And that's where we have our first introduction of like the origin story of Rabbi Akiva. Um, it's an amazing origin story where it talks about when he started learning. It's, I've only put the beginning here, but I'm happy to summarize the rest for you. Um, it is, um, he, he, Rabbi Akiva, was 40 years old when he went to study Torah, and after 13 years, he was teaching Torah to the masses. So the story is that Rabbi Kiva actually did not start off like Yaakov, um, learning Torah from a young age. He was a shepherd, he wasn't particularly educated, but he still felt like it was important to show uh, his children it was important to study Torah, so he took his children uh, to go learn, and that's how he got excited about Torah for the first time. 
they were showing him the olive bit and that's how he, he didn't even know it at the time. And he learned it for the first time at age 40. Um, and this was his first exposure uh, to Torah. And he also, the, there's an analogy there. It's a very beautiful analogy that uh, he realizes that Torah could be like water that pierces through a rock. And a rock is something that's so solid, but that water, if you get exposed to it enough times, has the ability to erode the rock. Um, and that that's what the Torah experience can be. He loved that image. Um, and that's how Rabbi Kiv is understood to be. They describe him as an okir at harim, someone who pulls up mountains. Um, that was what his Torah learning was like. Um, and he was so knowledgeable that even in the span of 13 years, he went from not knowing any Hebrew at all to teaching the masses, which is a great image. I hope it's like great encouragement for those of us who may be coming to learning Torah is a little bit newer in the game. Um, even someone like Rabbi Yekiva, who's one of the most well-known rabbis of the Talmud, he was able to only start that journey at, in the middle of his life and really progress quite far, which is lovely. Um, so yeah, so here, Yaakov and Rabbi Yekiva are both people of learning, a men of learning, but they seem to have different journeys um, going about it. Um, and I think that that's, that's interesting. I don't know if there's like much to glean from there unless people have ideas and I'd love to hear. But I think it's an interesting way to start us off in showing how there are both deep similarities between the two characters, but there's also uh, quite a few differences. Maybe both of them loving to learn Torah, but the approaches might be a little bit different. So that's where I thought it'd be a good place to start. Okay, the next similarity that I see for them is this relationship to shepherding. Um, going to um, the Brashid sources first, and this is now where we're in uh, Parsha Vayetze, back to our Parsha. Um, we learn about um, Yaakov after he is running away from Esav, after he stole the birthright. Esav wants to kill him, and he runs away, has this amazing, fantastical dream, um, which we're going to get to also in discussing. But then he comes and meets uh, Lavan, his uncle's family, and sees that there are shepherds in the family, and then also becomes one. And so it says, uh, Yaakov continues, is he well? Asking about Lavan. They answer, yes, he is. And there's his daughter, Rachel, coming with the flock. So eventually Yaakov is going to become a shepherd. But um, we first actually see Rachel um, being a shepherdess, which is interesting image uh, that she starts off that way first. And then a few psukim later, We have an explicit statement now that um, while Yaakov was speaking with uh, the other people in the area, uh, Rachel came with her father's flock for she was a shepherd. So she was a shepherd at the time. Yaakov is going to replace her and becoming the family shepherd. And then um, in the source we have in the Gemara, Rabbi Akiva is also a shepherd. It says, Rabbi Akiva Raya de then Kalba Sabua have it. That Rabbi Akiva was the shepherd of a man named Kalba Sabua, which is a funny name. If you recognize the Hebrew, even though that was his name, the name means very full dog. <laughs> Um, he was someone who was incredibly wealthy, so it seems to be that, that was maybe how the Gemara is understanding him um, as being, but he was his shepherd, and eventually we'll see when we go to more of the stories that Rachel, eventually Rabbi Akiva's wife, is Kalba Sabua's daughter, um, and that's how him and Rachel meet for the first time, which is very similar to our story with Yaakov and Rachel. Something that I think is interesting to note that is brought up when comparing these two stories, um, Daniel Boyarn, who's an academic, um, a Talmudic academic, and he does a lot of interesting comparisons of stories of love and relationships in the Talmud to other places. He notices that um, both Rabbi Akiva and Yaakov are shepherds, and their wives' names are Rachel, um, and Rachel also in Hebrew means an U, I, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, an E-W-E, <laughs> it's a, a young, like, sheep, female sheep, so there's something also interesting there, I guess, about, um, about the relationship between shepherd and um, young lamb. Um, on the one hand, it's like a beautiful image that the shepherd is taking care of the flock. On the other hand, it's like a little bit odd to describe a husband and wife um, in that way. But um, it's something that's that's apparent here um, in these texts from the get-go. All right, I'm going to continue a little farther, and I think we'll soon see some differences between the two that might be more fruitful for discussion to see what maybe what is one text have to say about the other. Okay, this is one I was most excited to talk about. So both Yaakov and Rabbi Akiva have spiritual experiences in their own way. Uh, the spiritual experience that we'll be familiar with with Yaakov is from this week's Parsha, a great image of um, Yaakov having a dream and having seen a ladder. And so it says, He, Yaakov, had a dream. 
A stairway was set on the ground and its top reached to the sky and messengers of God were going up and down it. Okay, so we have this image of there being a ladder, um, angels going up and down. That's what Yaakov experiences. Now, what experiences Rabbi Akiva have regarding spiritual experiences? Um, there is a story in the Gemara about four rabbis that entered the Pardes, which is an orchard, but there's a lot of mystical understandings of what that, what that actually entails. Um, and there's different descriptions of what happens to each rabbi when they enter the Pardes. Um, some rabbis turn out okay, and some are so scarred or damaged by that uh, spiritual experience, it was like too much for them to handle. And Rabbi Akiva is the only one of the four that comes out unscathed and totally fine. Um, and this is what it says about them. So there were four rabbis that went into the orchard, um, and these were them, Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, who is Elisha Ben Aguya, and Rabbi Akiva. Amar lehem Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said to them, So Rabbi Akiva said, okay, when you get to this mystical orchard, let me tell you what happens. When you get to this area, turn this way. Um, and so he says, when you get to these um, marble stones, don't say the words water, water, um, because uh, it's important that he brings in this pasuk from Tilim. He who speaks falsehood should not be established before my eyes. Very unusual story. Um, there's a lot of work um, on this in Kabbalistic literature, kind of saying that like he was seeing the palace of God and different levels of the palace. That's what the marble was. And it was so shiny that it was like water. Um, but it seems clearly here in comparison to the other rabbis who don't really make it out okay, that Rabbi Kiva is having some kind of mystical experience. Um, and yeah, I'm curious so far in the reactions that we've seen, um, if people are feeling like they see the connection clearly, maybe they think it's a little bit, you know, too far stretched. Do we think that there's what to be learned about one ex mystical experience or another mystical experience? Uh, yeah, feel free to participate. Yeah, very. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm thinking the different, <clears throat> the mystical experience is different here. Uh, in significant way, uh, Yaakov. I'm, 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 I'm just seeing for the first time what you're presenting us with Ravi Akiva. Uh, I have seen bits and pieces of his background, uh, Ravi Akiva and um, uh, Ben. Uh, I forgot his father's name, father-in-law's name. But anyway, I've I, I heard some of that. Uh, but. Uh, aside from the two women being named Rachel, there I, I think there's a significantly different background. Uh, Rabbi Akiva did not have to deal with the likes of Lavan. Uh, Yaakov Avinu, his his fortunes were based on him fleeing his home and and dealing with Lavan and 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 marrying two sisters and their 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 um uh. uh Maid servants and and uh, and and and, uh, uh, and all that. Yaakov had a deep, completely different background and a completely different uh, environment with which to 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 deal with God. And God comes to Yaakov. Yaakov sees the stairway, and here now I am to the point of where we are now. Yaakov sees the stairway from based on the earth and going up to the sky, where he where he or or, or commentary later tells us that this is the Beit Hamikdash. Of of heaven, over uh, at the same at, at some kind of same uh, relationship in, in 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 location one over the other as if there were two different condos one on top of the other, uh, but in the same place of uh, you know one in the corporeal world and one in heaven, one above the other, but. But Yaakov Avinu sees people going up and down, and I don't see any commentary, and I don't see any text about what he, what Yaakov Avinu is seeing the Beit Hamikdash upstairs. He's he God comes to him and he gives him his covenant. He, you know, I'm the God of your father. I'm the I'm the God of I'm God I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Yitzchak. Uh, and there's commentary about why he says he's the God of Yitzchak. Um, and I am with you. I am with you going. I'm with you coming. You stick with me, basically. 
and and these things, and he gives them the promises. So, but uh, but but Rabbi Akiva is not in this kind of circumstance where he's being prepped to go into the lion's den of of, uh, of Lavan and deal with that. Uh, Rabbi Akiva is maybe he's dealing with his own father-in-law's lions then, I don't know, but he is is evidently seeing heaven from a different perspective. He's not looking up at it. He actually, according to what I'm seeing here, enters it and sees part of it and uh, uh, and, and and what's going on. And, and that is a whole completely different take on heaven and earth. So I don't, yeah. I, don't see, I don't I don't see too much parallel between these two guys at this particular point. It's, it, you know, maybe <laughs> circumstantial, but but that's me. So uh, I will say educate me, people. I will Correct say me. that that part of what we will be discussing is both Rabbi Kiva and Yaakov have not so great relationships with their fathers in law, and that's what we're going to get to, or maybe you'll see some more. So hang tight for that. Um, I do think as much as these mystical experiences are different although I would say like it seems like Rabbi Kiva is entering some kind of palace above while also Yaakov is seeing things going up and down that um, the idea that there is a recorded rabbi in the Talmud to have a mystical experience is quite unusual there's a lot of discussion about tila, about um, how to have kavana but to actually have like uh, an agadic anecdote story that is about a my mystical experience that a rabbi has I think is quite rare um it's really exciting. Like what it's when we hear halakhic opinions about rabbis, uh, one wonders like what was the context in which the, they were given. And what's really exciting about Rabbi Akiva is there's so much written about his backstory. Um, so I think that that's like why this is especially fruitful. Um, so it, I think that there's something special about Rabbi Akiva that we know so much backstory, but also that we have an opportunity to hear about him having his own religious ex and spiritual experience as opposed to like just dictating halakha about it. I think that that's pretty unusual. Um, although I agree with you that what seems to be similar here about Yaakov and, and Rabbi Kiva is that they've had mystical experiences. I don't know if it's exactly mapped on the, the same kind of mystical experience. So I, I, I take your point there. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything they want to share before we continue? Yeah, put me back on the right path, shall we? <laughs> okay, let's see some more parallels. So now we're going to get to the love of Rachel. Um, this is where I think there can be some similarities. Spoiler alert, at the end of the sure, we're going to get to a question of how much is this actually love or are there problematic aspects of, of their love for both of these characters? Um, but for Rishi, and this is also in our um, Parsha this week, um, it says, after Yaakov meets Rachel for the first time, seeing that she's a shepherdess, um, that he loves her. It says, Yaakov and Rachel, Jacob loved Rachel, so he answered, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. This is exciting because this is the first time the verb uh, to love actually appears in the entire Tanakh. Um, so that makes it also pretty unusual. Um, actually, it might be true about Yaakov as well, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, but it's quite rare. Like, I think it comes up here, it comes up um, with David, um, talking about Michal, um, also talking about Yonatan, it doesn't come up so often, like the idea of, of marriage or even friendship being about like deep care or love is not so common, which makes sense, like the context in which they were was not like so focused on that, things were much more business transaction oriented, all the way going back to our discussion of, um, of um, Parsha Chai Sarah, we were talking about um, Abraham and Sarah, um, yeah. but this is, this is pretty exciting and different that um, that here, um, that Yaakov actually loved Rachel. Um, so the question of what does it actually mean for there to be love is one thing. Um, what I think is exciting about the next source we're going to read about Rabbi Akiva and Rachel, um, his wife Rachel, uh, we're going to see, it's not going to say that he loved her, but we're going to hear like a very cute story about them that is a really beautiful example of what romance could have looked like in that time period. That's pretty rare. Um, I'm going to read in English for the sake of time. In the winter, um, they would sleep in the store, storehouse of straw. So Rabbi Akiva and Rachel would do this. They were very poor. Kalba Savua, who we were discussing his father-in-law, was very rich, but he was very unhappy with Rabbi Akiva. He was just a shepherd. He did not want to marry off his daughter to someone like that. So they were left with no money, and they would go sleep in barn houses to keep warm. 
Rabbi Akiva would gather strands of straw from her hair because they were sleeping in the straw, so it would get stuck. He said to her, if I had the means, I would place on your head a Jerusalem of gold, a type of crown. Elijah the prophet came and appeared to them as a regular person and started calling and knocking on the door. Um, so Rabbi Akiva promises Rachel and says, I wish I could give you something that would make you feel and look so beautiful, but it's also like a beautiful image. It's like taking out the straw out of her hair and they're wanting to have a better life together. All of a sudden, Eliyahu Hanavi shows up. He said to them, give me a bit of straw as my wife gave birth and I do not have anything on which to lay her. Rabbi Akiva said to his wife, see this man who does not even have straw. We should be happy with our lot as we at least have straw to sleep on. So this is a, this is a motif that's quite common uh, throughout the Talmud where Eliyahu Hanavi arrives as some kind of character that is asking for help. And it's like a test of the other person's ability to give. Um, often he'll appear as a, as a poor man coming to a house for a meal. Um, and then the test is how much are we gonna welcome him in? Partially also why he might be the one that we invite in um, on Pesach or just invite everyone to our uh, household for Seder, anyone who needs. And then you can see Rabbi Kiva has this beautiful image of what the of what he wants the straw to be. And he says, oh, but, you know, as much as I want you to be having a crown, like we should give it to this person who definitely needs it more than us, um, which is testament to how um, Rabbi Akiva um, is, ultimately he does care for Rachel, but also has these other beautiful values in mind. But I think what's really exciting about this story is we don't often get to see the intimate lives of uh, the rabbis and their spouses, um, and that this is how he was treating Rachel, as opposed to it just being merely kind of a business transaction for someone to raise his kids. He seems to really care for her and want a lot for her and want to adorn her and make her feel beautiful in a way that I think is, is pretty unusual and, and quite beautiful to show a kind of love at that time period. So both Rabbi Kiva and Yaakov, in an unusual sense, show love for their spouse um, in a way that's quite uncommon for that time period, which I think is interesting. Okay, if we're not convinced yet, <laughs> we'll, we'll do some more and then we'll, we'll go back and analyze. Um, both Yaakov and Rabbi Hiva put in time twofold for their, to gain their, the father-in-law's approval for Rachel. Um, so you might be familiar with the story then in Breshi, where Yaakov loves Rachel so much that he works for seven years, um, and then he has to work again. Um, so this is what it says. Yaakov loved Rachel, so he answered, I will serve you, Lavan, seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Um, and then... Um, this is what uh, Lavan says a few psukim afterward. Wait until the bridal week of this one is over and we will give you that one too, provided you serve me another seven years. So basically what happens is Lavan says, great, I will give you uh, Rachel, sounds good. Um, after you work for me for seven years, you show that you are worthy of having her. Um, but he tricks him and he says, oh, well, Rachel has this older sister, Leah, and it would just be improper to marry one, uh, the older, the younger one before the older one. So work another seven years and then you'll gain Rachel too, which is not the nicest. Um, and so it says Jacob did so, he waited out the bridal week of the one and then he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. So he gets Rachel, but he has to work another seven years. So say it again. It could have been worse. I so, thought I, 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 th I thought in later time, when I first read this, I read, I, I was thinking exactly what you're saying. And I thought the standard pitch on this and then all of a sudden, I started recently thinking in, in, in my restudy of this section uh, as it comes up each year. Uh, Lavan actually threw ya Yaakov Avinu a bone. He let her marry her before he finished working the seven years, uh, this, the second seven years for her. And so I'm, I'm thinking Yaakov Avinu had, had a little bit of benefit here. And, and this differentiates the pure uh, work seven more years and then you can marry her. So I'm seeing a benefit here. I, there's definitely a benefit. You doesn't have to wait another seven years to get her, but I think the real benefit would just not have to work at all for, for your wife. <laughs> I think that that would be the ultimate win. Um, and they well, are related. You'd think, you know, some useless would kind of get him somewhere. But, there's um, a benefit there too, I think. Yeah. So here, the structure, though, is clearly seven and seven, but there's double. And then it's interesting um, yeah. what then is double-double in the story about Rabbi Kiva and his wife. So we heard Rabbi Kiva's origin story before he didn't know any Torah at all. All of a sudden, he starts learning Torah a lot. And what does what happens next? Um, right now, in this stage of the story, Kalba Savua, Rachel's um, husband, does not like Rabbi Kiva very much. He doesn't think that he's an established person in the community. 
So what's his revenue? Father, what, right? Say it again. Her father, right? Yeah, so her father and then Rabbi Akiva's father. Right. So what does Rachel say to him? She says, she said to him, go be a student of Torah. You seem to be really liking Hebrew, Rabbi Akiva. It's time for you to learn more. He went and studied Torah for 12 years before Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. These were the great rabbis at the time. At the completion of the 12 years, he was coming home when he heard from behind his house that one wicked person was saying to his wife, your father behaved well toward you. He was right to disinherit you. Because that's what happened when, when Rabbi Akiva and Rachel eloped. Kabbalah was very unhappy with him. One reason is that your husband is not similar to you. He is not suitable for you. And furthermore, he has left you in widowhood in his lifetime all of these years. So one, they're saying he's not worthy and Torah study would make him worthy, but he's left you for 12 years, which is a fair point. That's quite terrible. She said to him, if he listens to me, he should be there for another 12 years. Rabbi Kiva said, since she's given me permission through this statement, I will go back and study more. He turned back and went to the study hall and he was there for another 12 years. So it's not the same as Yaakov in the sense that it wasn't seven and seven, but it was 12 and 12. And it has to do again with this idea of like earning, um, <laughs> earning the approval of others in order to make sure that Rachel gets to be his wife. Um, we'll see as we compare the stories, um, you'll see how it is connected to the approval of Kalba Sabu of the father-in-law in the Rabbi Akiva story. Um, but to me, it seems again, an unusual comparison where it's double double workload in order to gain approval. And I feel like that can't merely be a coincidence. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on anything we've seen so far before we move on? Sorry, <laughs> I do have a point. Um, oh. I'm, I'm thinking Rabbi Akiva and Rachel, didn't, they agreed on this approach, didn't they? Am I, am I not seeing that here? Yeah, or, the 12 or, years. Or, or maybe I've seen it elsewhere, but I've seen it. Uh, they, Which aspect? She, she was, that, that she was on board. Rachel was on board for him studying the 12 years and the 12 years. Yeah. I thought so. And, 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 and he amassed students. And uh, I think there's a story about him coming home with the students behind him. And, uh, and she didn't, it's not right here. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm going outside the, uh, uh, the material before us. But I think the story is broader, and 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 uh, and he comes he comes back, and he's got all these students, and she doesn't recognize him, and then uh, she finds out who he is, and she bows down to him, and and it, it, and it's a there's a, there's a whole lot of things going on there that I haven't quite wrapped my head around, but I'm pretty sure she's on board with with Rabbi with with Rabbi Akiva, and what he did for the study. Um, I'm not sure how the father-in-law plays into that second 12 years uh, uh, and how that goes, but he eventually became aware of Rabbi Akiva's renown and, and his, uh, his value to the people. And uh, he, he realized what a, what, a, what a diamond he had as a son-in-law. So yeah, I don't know, but it's a whole different life than, than, than our forefathers and foremothers. Whole different yes. life. They were, they were together. They went through the strifes together. They went through the... Uh, Yaakov and, and, and Rachel went through the um, uh, uh, barrenness together uh, with Rachel and how they differed from how Yitzchak and, and, and Rivka de dealt with theirs. And, and, uh, and Yaakov makes a point, and yet I feel he was harsh when he did that, when, when Rachel came to him uh, and, and said, you know, you know you, you, you're having children with my, with my sister, why aren't you praying for me like your father prayed for your mother? And Yaakov turns around to him and he says, I'm having sons with your sister and with, with the maidservants. It's not on me, honey, it's on you. You know, you're not the same as, as, their, as, as that situation. And it's like, he's justifying why he, he, he felt he shouldn't be blamed for not praying. And yet it's harsh. If he loved the woman, and I believe he did, he should have been praying for her. Somehow he went harsh on that particular point. Maybe his father-in-law rubbed off a little bit on him. I don't know. So we're going to see that story also, um, oh, because okay. I think that in both stories, there's questionable um, interactions of, no, 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 thank you for sharing. Um, we'll, we'll see there's questionable reactions of both Yaakov and Rabbi Kiva to things that Rachel um, suggests. I do think that it's clear in this text, as opposed to the other texts, where Lavan is saying, okay, like to get Rachel, you have to work this much. It's clear that, that Rachel in the Rabbi Akiva story is like much more excited about him learning for 12 years. Um, 
I think what we're gonna discuss and maybe question um, when we get to the sources later is like, how much is that like the ideal, right? Like on the one hand, they're both approving. On the other hand, it's still pretty sad. Um, and I think that it's true that that um, these people here who are kind of taunting her being like, how great is your husband anyway? They're like throwing in like, oh, he's not even here. Like, does he even care about you? But they're really trying to question his legitimacy as like any kind of established person. That's why they mentioned that the father disinherits her. Um, we'll see when we come up now to how um, both father-in-laws have a change of heart, um, how that will connect. Um, but I think this, this idea of double work um, and seeing the Torah learning as work here is something that doesn't feel like a coincidence to me. Uh, any other people want to share before we continue? All right, um, feel free to share as um, we go through more. Okay, so this one is now about how both Rabbi Kiva and Yaakov benefit from their fathers-in-law in slightly different ways. Um, how they not just benefit, but financially benefit. Um, the story that we're gonna read um, from Rashid is again from Parsha Vayetze. This is at the stage where Yaakov has really been overworked and he figures out this scheme where he comes up with this deal with Lavan and says, hey, if all of these sheep are birthed with many spots, um, I'll get the profit for them or I'll get more than you would. Um, and at first, Lavan says that's a great idea because it's quite unusual for these sheep to be born with spots. And then Yaakov kind of tricks around and he figures out a way to uh, cause the it's a great question from a scientific perspective. I don't really know how this works, yeah. Yeah. but he causes. Um, like these genetic mishaps to happen where there are much more sheep that are born with spots. And then that way he gets more money than Lavan does, um, which is quite tricky, but I guess that's not so sh shocking for a character like Yaakov. It says, but with the people or animals, he would not place them there. Thus the people ones went to Lavan and the story to Jacob. So not only was the spotted situation like that, um, but he also figured out to make all the weak um, sheep go to Lavan and the stronger ones to go to Yaakov, which is again, kind of trickstery. And it says, so the man grew exceedingly prosperous, Yaakov, and came to own large flocks, maid servants, and men servants, camels, and asses. So Yaakov, through trickery of his father-in-law and through profiting from his father-in-law, gained a lot of wealth. And now um, we have this story um, from Rabbi Akiva that is similar to the one that, that Barry mentioned, where after 24 years, after the two times 12, um, Rabbi Akiva returns, and people don't even recognize who he is. He's like such an established Torah scholar. And this is what it says. In the meantime, her father, Rachel's father, Kalba Sevua, heard that a great man came to town. He said, I will go to him. Maybe he will nullify my vow and I'll be able to support my daughter. Because originally, Kalba Sevua was so angry about Rachel wanting to marry Rabbi Akiva. He said, I swear I will never give her any money. And <laughs> yes, I'll do that. He came to him and to ask about nullifying the vow. And Rabbi Akiva said to him, did you vow thinking that this Akiva would become a great man? And then he said to him, if I had believed he would know even one chapter or one halacha, I would not have been so harsh. He said to him, I am he. So at first, Kalbas doesn't even recognize Rabbi Akiva and his great new establishment. It's almost like the Yosef story um, in a few parts from now where he is the viceroy of Egypt and the brothers don't recognize him. Um, and Kalbas says, oh, you're such an amazing man. And then Rabbi Akiva, before he reveals himself, says, well, if you had thought that this son-in-law of yours would become learn it at all, even know one chapter or one halacha, maybe, maybe then you would have been nicer than less harsh. And Kabbalah says, yes, that would have been the case. Grand reveal, Rabbi Kiv says, that is me. Then Kabbalah Sivua fell on his face and kissed his feet and gave him half his money. So automatically there, not only did the vow, I guess, undo, because they realized that the vow was given under different circumstances where Kabbalah Sivua would never realize that Rabbi Akiva would have risen from being, I guess, the bum that he thought he was. But not only that, he was so astounded how far Rabbi Kiva had come, that he gives him half of his money. And Kalba Sabu, as we said, uh, a full satisfied dog, the translation is very lucky. So giving half of, of one's wealth uh, was pretty significant. And then that's how Rabbi Akiva benefits from his father-in-law, which I think, even though it's not the same trickery as Yaakov, so maybe that's, that's what we can learn about juxtaposing these stories, that Rabbi Akiva didn't have to trick in the same way that Yaakov did. 
Um, but he also gains his father-in-law's approval at the time and also financially benefits from it, which I think is interesting. The last words I want to leave us with before we can like analyze what, what was the nature of, of this compare and contrast and how we feel about it is this question of love that we've come back to. We had this beautiful story of Rabbi Akiva and Rachel playing with the straw um, and wanting to have a more beautiful uh, life for Rachel. And we also had that Yaakov was one of the first characters and have to actually love his wife. But now I want to question, um, similar to what you were discussing before, like what actually does this love look like for both of them and are there problematic aspects to it? So um, this verse, um, there's again from Vayetze. We are in a stage where um, Yaakov is married to Leah, Rachel, and also their two concubines. He's able to have a lot of children with Leah. Um, God opened up her womb and closed up Rachel's because it was clear that Yaakov loved Rachel and not Leah. So that was God's way of kind of balancing things out. Um, and this is what happened. When Rachel saw that she had born Jacob no children, she became envious of her sister. And Rachel said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob was incensed at Rachel and said, can I take the place of God who has denied you fruit of the womb? So this is obviously a very sad reaction on Rachel's end. Um, it seems a little bit melodramatic, but also one, the experience of infertility is incredibly painful. And two, especially in this time period, the woman being the, the child rearing, the child bearing machine was like what defined womanhood. And so the idea that she can't give me children or I shall die, it could be a melodramatic statement. It also could be a deeply existential one where she says, I don't understand, like my rule doesn't make sense. Like this is what women are supposed to be doing in this culture and I can't. And yet Yaakov is really rude to her in response. He's not sympathetic. I was like, why that's so tough. But he says, oh, who am I? Like, I can't control. Um, right. I'm not God who can give you children. Um, you should you should not be mad at me for this, um, which doesn't feel like such a fair response. Um, I don't think Rachel was taking out her anger at Yaakov, but I think it would be very fair to say that in a, in a healthy, loving relationship, expressing frustration and anguish to a spouse would make a lot of sense. And Yaakov somehow takes it kind of personally, which I find to be a little bit solipsistic and, and rude. He thinks, well, it's not, it's not my fault. And also it's, it's true. He's having children with Leah and uh, the other concubines. So yeah. he thinks, oh, well, this isn't really my problem. But um, if we think about that, is that really what love is supposed to be? I'm not sure. Um, no, not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it is not. Um, now I want to contrast it with the Rabbi Kiva version of what problems appear. And then hopefully we can come back and, and talk about all of these. Um, so this is a story that, that Barry was mentioning earlier earlier. Eventually, Rabbi Kiva came back accompanied by 24,000 pairs of students. That's how many students he had accumulated in that short time. Oh, yeah. Everyone went out to greet him, and he, as he was by then a renowned teacher. And she, Rachel, too arose to go out to greet him. That wicked person said to her, and to where are you going? Um, this was that same one that was taunting her from before. As she was excessively poor, she was not dressed in grand manner, as fit for the wife of someone so esteemed. She said to him, a righteous man regards the life of his beast. He knows that I am in this state, this state as a result of my dedication to him. So don't be so angry that I don't look so, so wealthy. I am poor because I, I have not been able to financially support myself because he's been learning this whole time. And he knows that. She came to present himself before Rabbi Akiva, but the sages tried to fend her off as they were unaware of her identity. They saw this, this poor woman, ragged woman, touching his feet. And they're like, oh, get her, get her away from this renowned man. Rabbi Akiva said to them, leave her. Both my Torah knowledge and yours are hers. When Bar Kava Subuwa heard that the famous man was his son-in-law, he came before halachic authorities and requested the dissolution of his vow, and it was dissolved. So on the one hand, Rachel is the one who enabled him to go learn, and that's a beautiful story. On the other hand, this is a very distressing image, the idea that people didn't even recognize her as his wife. Um, and it's great that they, he said, leave him alone. But he doesn't pick her up from the ground. He doesn't give her a hug after multiple years. And he says, oh, what, what my Torah is her Torah. It's great that he's crediting her for that, but it's still not the most warm of embrace. Um, and I, I don't know if that necessarily should be the paradigm, again, of what a loving relationship is. So those are all the comparisons I have. Um, I have a paragraph at the end about what, what is the benefit of, of reading these kinds of comparisons that we'll get to. But I'm curious now that we've looked at all the comparisons I've offered, um, what people think, if they think that some of these are far stretched, 
if they're shocked or surprised with some of these stories, some problems that arise. The one thing I'll say before we open that up to tie everything together, um, I'd, like I said before, Rachel is an ewe, a young sheep, and both Yaakov and Rabbi Kiva are shepherds. I also think that it's important to note that Yaakov and Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva is an anagram for Yaakov. Um, they both have the Shorish, Ayin, Kuf, Bet. I think that's also very interesting. That shows that they must have another connection um, that we might not realize. Akiva and Yaakov. Um, you oh. have to listen a little bit phonetically um, to, to hear it, but it's there. Um, so that's also why I don't feel like I'm totally putting this out of the blue. Um, but yeah, I'm curious what people think if they found these comparisons thoughtful, interesting. You can also express disinterest. Um, I'm curious how people are reacting. I have some thoughts I'd like to share, and sit, but after other people, so feel free to express there. <laughs> Come on, you guys. <laughs> Educate me. There, you can start us off. And then if anyone else wants to share, please. All right. Um, I have two different points of view on the two uh, um, revered men, uh, Yaakov Avinu, and a separate, uh, a separate point of view about him and, and a separate point of view about Rabbi Akiva. My first question about Rabbi Akiva is, did they have children? Rocky, Rabbi Akiva and Rachel, did they have children? Were, were, were any of them sons? So that's you know, a great, you know? that, yeah, so it's a debate um, in different texts. So the original Rabbi, uh, Avot to Rabbi Nathan text that we had um, suggests that he did have sons because he takes them to learn. That's not clear in the other texts of the Gemara. There are some texts that say that he had daughters and that one of them was married to Ben Azai. Um, that also isn't necessarily clear because a lot of other readings of these stories suggest that there was like a life of barrenness um, because um, Rachel and Rabbi Yehuda were just never together um, because he was in the Beit Midrash. So yeah. there are different accounts of what that is, uh, of how that pans out. Um, and I do think that the strand that suggests maybe there was a time of infertility, that definitely would also match onto Rachel of Tanakh pretty well. I was curious because that, that seems to be absent from my understanding of the story. I, in other words, I didn't hear that or, or read that as much like I have read and seen most of this stuff. But back to Yaakov Avinu, I think he was certainly harsh. And I got a question, his level of love versus his level of frustration uh, with his situation uh, about uh, what was known to, to, to Rivka and Leah. Uh, by uh, according to Rashi commentary, let me preface that I'm a student of Rashi commentary because my my chumash is such my chumash is a, is a linear uh, uh, printing uh, of of the Torah text with Hebrew and English linear and Rashi commentary corresponding to the to the to the uh, uh, Torah text, and it's it's clear from Rashi's commentary that things were known to these women, for example. And, and, and somehow absent from Yaakov's understanding of his comment to Rachel about, hey, it's not on me, it's on you. You know, who am I? Yeah, I'm not God who, who, who denies you the fruit of your womb, uh, basically because Leah's having sons and, and the other two are having sons. And, and I found that harsh because both Leah and, and Yaakov uh, and, and, and Rachel <laughs> seem to have known that at the time, women who didn't bear sons in their lives were considered as if they were dead maybe uh, or something like that but 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 I'm, I'm i'm a little hazy on that one but i'm certainly uh, clear on the rashi commentary that if she didn't if if rachel didn't bear sons within 10 years of the marriage that yaakov avinu would would the, the 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 process was that the man would divorce the woman and she would be subject to, to asa and that was clear Rashi commentary, and and that's distressing. And how how these two women uh, who knew that the oh Leah, who was lesser beautiful, so to speak, in physical feature, according to to the description of her weak eyes and Rachel's beauty of countenance, uh, that Leah was was destined for Esav and Rachel for somebody like Yaakov Avinu, and the older and the older and the younger and the younger. Um, but that it, it, it we know how it turns out. But this was a pressure at the time for Rachel. And yet, 
later on, there's Rashi commentary that Rachel's tent was always Yaakov's tent in her lifetime. And so she, she was the main wife uh, and stayed the main wife because she did deliver Yosef and, and actually in, 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 and died in childbirth with, with Benjamin. But there was, there was pressure on these women and Leah was getting all the press. She, she delivered half of the tribes. And, and, and the other two, their, their quarter each or whatever it is, and, 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 uh, uh, and Rachel, or you know, half, half, so sixth and sixth and sixth. So, so Rachel wasn't having anybody and, until she finally got ya- Yosef. And that to me is, makes Yaakov's comment very harsh to her. He should have known what they knew. And that baffles me. There's, I'm not seeing anything that, that's, that shows his behavior knew that. And yet he, he did. And, and these women had every reason to be fearsome of, of having to be in, in Esau's uh, domain. And, uh, and, and so that, that's, that's, a, that's a horrifying, horrifying thing to me. So this was, this was a pretty good story and, and a contrast. And I think you did beautifully to pre- present these, these things to us for, for, uh, um, for, for compare and contrast. But there's a lot of differences in these stories that uh, uh, that that go there. We we already established the country. Yaakov Avinu had the pressure of having to have the twelve sons, and, and the women all knew that, right? As really knew she had half the sons. Uh, the other two knew they c- carried their their portions. Rachel was uh, was the one who was who was sweating it out until the end, and that was to me unfair. And yet she seemed to be the mistress of the family, so. Uh, I don't know. I'm a, I'm one confused guy. There's about a lot the, of family about dynamics. the love. About the love, I'm definitely confused. Yes, there are a lot of definitely unusual family dynamics. I think there was a lot of pressure around child rearing in a way that's that's very different today. And also, we live in a world where infertility is um, is different. It's different ways of of being potentially treated and different understandings of family structure. Um, but really in this time period, this really was like the, the way that they defined their personhood. Um, and it is true that Rachel was the more loved one. Um, but I, yeah, if she's the more loved one, it's still shocking to me that, that Yaakov's response is this. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Andre, go for it. So harsh. I, um, I'm a woman professional and I feel like everyone defines me by, you know, my possession of a uterus and either my status or potentiality to be a mother. I don't know that we've really gotten away from this. Mm. I hope other people are having different experiences, but um, I I think we can have a lot of empathy for for Rahel here, but I I don't know that we've we've gone too far away from identifying women primarily as mothers or potential mothers or is being lesser than if they they don't have children Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's that's a really important point we are in some ways like far more ahead in advance than when these texts um were first delivered but in some ways we have a lot of work to do and i think what's very exciting about the jewish tradition um is one to see already like we were saying like the story of rabbi akiva and rachel there are a lot of problems with it but it does seem that there's a little more partnership between the two spouses to see there's like a kind of tikkun or embetterment as the generations go on. Hopefully that can inspire us to uh, do have some embetterment as well, even farther than what's already written down. Um, but I think that, I think that especially in the Jewish tradition, having issues with the text is, is deeply welcomed. And that part of the process is us reacting to it and thinking, well, how's that going to change my actions farther? What is this helping me think about, helping me realize, put to the forefront, something that might have not been on my mind uh, beforehand and hopefully that can help me then call it out in the future so i think that these stories can do that as well um there's a really powerful um collection of modern feminist midrashim called dirshuni um is a collection of israeli um women who have written these midrashim it's very interesting like what does that mean to write midrash in the 20th 21st century but they take the style of midrash and they decide to write what would like matriarchs and other female characters in Tanakh have, have said if they had a chance to have written their own Midrashim, which is very powerful. Um, there's actually an English translation of this book coming out this weekend. Um, there's a 
a launch of the of English translation in New York um, that I'm hoping I'll be better enough to go to. Um, but there is a really interesting midrash about this Rebbe Yekiva and Rachel story where it is recognizing that it is better than the Yaakov and Rachel story, but also how problematic it is still, meaning that um, in the same way that Midrash has multiple voices, like this person says this, this person says that, um, there's a story of what was the interaction when Rachel and Rabbi Akiva met again for the first time, what was that like? So one is that it was a beautiful embrace they caught up over the past few years. Another one was that uh, Rachel had an opportunity to go learn on her own in a different baby midrash. It was all women. So that's fictional, but it's supposed to make us like think like, what would like true equal partnership look like? And there's one approach that says they embraced. And then she said like, you are not allowed to step into my house again. You have left me for the past 24 years and I'm hurt. Even though I said you could, why did you fight me back? So right, it's supposed right. to get you thinking, right? Like it's, right. these are not things that are written canonically in the text. But the purpose of these modern midrashim is to be like, what were the voices that were missing? What, what could we be doing even better than what already exists? And what could be propelling us in that direction? So, so maybe Andre, your, your point is taken and maybe we gotta think of what does the 21st century have to say about what these texts should be looking like and what we should be taking away from them. Can I add a comment on Audrey's and, 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 make, and, and make some unsolicited advice, which is take it or leave it, don't worry about it. But you, you make a good point and it's a sad but, but honest commentary about our society. And yet I think speaking from my own existence, uh, Audrey and the rest of you who, can, who, can, who, who share the thought and I see the thought, you have an audience that will embrace and sympathize and hear you loud and clear, and that is guys like me, fathers of daughters. In today's world with fathers and daughters, fathers of daughters, you got to be able to approach these guys and, and, and wake them up and have them wake up others, like a domino kind of thing. Um, you know, I, uh, I consider myself fully modern orthodox in my own skin, and I'm good with it. But I wasn't always this way. I was raised conservative. Um, my daughters were sent to grade school in a, in a conservative Jewish parochial environment, and they were being taught to lane uh, aspects of Torah during their schooling. And, and there is no way in a modern Orthodox situation where they can ever lane before a, com a, a, a congregation in a, in, a, in a full congregation service. But our show has separately you'll have women's this and women's that right women's reading of a megillah women's service and where where women actually lean from the torah and i'm embracing that kind of thing and i don't know if i'm uh, forgive me it's just how i've evolved i'm not so comfortable uh, i know i can't admit that i'm comfortable with with hearing that in in the services i attend to because i am my father's son in some ways but uh it not in the good ones, but but in some ways. But and yet, I love to hear my daughters lane when 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 they were in school, and I'm glad they have that background. I think that that there should be a lot more egalitarian education, and and guys like me are the guys you should be, you know, back and you know recruiting, and 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 getting to if you want to turn this around, we're we're a population that you should be considering, um, and that'll. I don't know if I have time otherwise, but I will give you lip service. I'll tell you that. I would encourage. So uh, women deserve it. Women deserve more than being just the home. And we're not, we're not those days anymore. It's, an, it's, it's a two-person parental home and, and workplace. And you deserve that respect. And you deserve that glass ceiling being blown up. And, and, and you deserve your equality in that regard. Um, don't don't lure me in onto the services <laughs> aspect of it, but but and yet I'm good with the with the with the things that are going on. I'm good with women carrying the Torah uh, uh, in the, in the show. I'm good with these things, and so we too are are are, are audiences for that. Um, hit the fathers and daughters. We should be your allies. Audrey, did you want to have a final word before we look at the last source? Um, I don't really want a final word, but I, I'd love to have coffee with Barry someday. Um, <laughs> thank you, Barry. I, I, love no, I, I thought I'd make a lighthearted comment of the origin of the phrase 
do you want an earner or a learner? Um, <laughs> after seeing the reading on um, someone who went away for 12 or 24 years to study and for, for that to be celebrated. But, so, uh, yeah, thank you for, for your comments, Barry. You're welcome. And my 73 <laughs> year old comments in response to your learner and earner one is why should they be mutually exclusive? Why can't you have both? Why shouldn't you encourage both in your daughters and your sons? Oh, yeah. On that note, sure. um, okay. <laughs> let's go. Let's go to the last verse. Just I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, Me too. So the 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 way that we led this class is a little bit different than the other ones that we've had, where we've had one Tanakh source, one Gemara source, then discussion. This is more compare contrast, almost like a literary criticism model. Like if you're in an English class and you're trying to compare two stories. So the question is, what are the values of that? And so hopefully you gain some values, but I think that this sentence, this paragraph really takes it. Um, this comes from a book, uh, Subversive Sequels by Judy Klitzner. I believe maybe she's even come to ASPI to speak before. Um, oh, okay. An amazing book. She talks about um, how stories in Tanakh, and I'm going to extrapolate and say we can also connect it to stories in the Talmud, are often like very conscientiously in dialogue with each other. And some have, uh, by having stories that kind of repeat themselves, that there's always a difference in how they're repeated and we have to learn from those differences. That's what I'm hoping we did tonight. So let's see what she says. There are no simple or formulaic answers to these questions, as in why they're repeated stories. But I propose a particular type of textual analysis, literary in nature, that at very least reframes the questions themselves. As if aware of its own problematics, the Bible contains a lovely interaction between its passages and allows for a widening of perspective and a sense of dynamic development throughout the canon. As we will see in the six chapters of this book, this is an introduction, um, if certain naive theological or philosophical questions remain after studying one narrative, a later passage may revisit those questions, subjecting them to a complex process of inquiry, revision, and examination of alternative possibilities. I'll call these reworking subversive sequels. Like all sequels, they continue and complete earlier stories, but they do so in ways that often undermine the very assumptions upon which the earlier stories were built, as well as the conclusions that these stories have reached. So basically what she's saying is that, yes, it's true that stories repeat themselves in Tanakh, in Talmud. We don't have to see it as just a, a recycling of characters, but by reiterating these stories in a new generation, we have something new to gain from and new things to notice. So on the one hand, some of these stories that we saw were very similar and some they were incredibly different. And our job is to think, well, what is the benefit of seeing these stories in tandem? And hopefully tonight we saw some of those benefits. Some of them, I think, like are left with more better questions than answers. But hopefully uh, by doing this approach, it was maybe something new for people here, kind of having some more literary approach. And to be thinking about it, it's kind of beautiful that there are stories in the Talmud that are very aware of the stories in Tanakh and, and what are they doing? How are they building off of what was already there? And hopefully it can lead to fruitful conversation, which I think it did tonight. So thank you so much. I went one minute over time, so apologies for that. But thank you for sticking with it. And uh, we'll see each other next week. Thank you I'll go so on much, record everyone. for liking it. Thank you. Thank ah, you. So thank you, Bella. Thank you. Thank Have you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Sophia. Bye.